Well, tonight we're in the last three verses of Isaiah 53. So you may be thinking, yeah, we're done with Isaiah 53 after tonight. That's not true. Um, once I get through verse by verse, the more I study it, the more there is to teach. And um, so I want to spend time, next time I teach, and maybe a time after that, and after that, I don't know how long it's going to take, but um, I want to spend some time looking at the chapter as a whole, because um, there's a lot of things there that we need to look at. And I'm contemplating whether or not to, to commit one message just in seeing how Jesus fulfills Isaiah 53. I think most of us are pretty aware of that, but um, that may be a good, good thing to review. So we may be doing that as well. So I'd say at least two more messages, maybe three after tonight. So don't close your Bible on Isaiah 53 yet. So uh, let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Lord, we thank you so much for being a gracious God just beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, the extent of your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, your love is just beyond us. We just never will be able to fathom that. And we're thankful, Lord, that we can't because it shows us that you're an immense God, a God that's bigger than life, a God that's bigger than any need or problem or situation we find ourselves in. So, Lord, we know that we can come to you in prayer. We know that we can bring our problems, our concerns to you. And you're able to handle those, Lord. You're able to answer those questions. You're able to uh, give us peace and joy and comfort and rest in knowing you. So, Lord, tonight we pray that you'll open our hearts, open our minds, uh, help us to comprehend just a little bit more of you, uh, to see you um, a little bit better, a little more clearly, and Lord, may it change our lives. I pray that you'll help me uh, to teach your word in a way that's pleasing and honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Huh, I grabbed the wrong book. <laughs> I'm not going to sing to you tonight. <laughs> I wish somebody would put Isaiah 53 to song. Maybe they have, um, but that would be a good, be a great song. <clears throat> um, it's been a while, so I think I'm going to take just a moment and read the entire chapter of Isaiah 53, just so we um, see it in its context. And actually, I'll start with 52.13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. 
by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And that was from the New American Standard Bible. I think it's actually a blessing to have several different translations of the Bible that we can refer to. Helps us to uh, see the different ways that it can be translated uh, so that we get a better understanding of Scripture. So tonight we're going to be looking at the last three verses, 10, 11, and 12. Um, I don't really have an outline per se, but We're going to be looking at four basic points, each of them mentioned in these last three verses. The first point is pleased. The Lord was pleased to crush him. The second point is crushed. The third point is satisfied. But the Lord was, I'm sorry, um, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And the last one is justified. So we're going to look at those four points tonight and probably pick up a few others along the way. But before we get into that, a few introductory comments. Uh, In the last couple messages, we focused on Christ's suffering, the Messiah's suffering. Um, This evening, we'll see his exaltation. Remember the beginning and the ending of this chapter are his exaltation and the middle section is his suffering. So I thought it'd be kind of good to put a couple verses together here from the beginning of the chapter and the end just so we can see his exaltation. 52.13 says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The second half of 10, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And 12, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Kind of follows, in in some ways kind of follows kind of a nice prayer format. Begin by praising God and bring our needs, our suffering, our toils to him, and again, end with praising God. Regarding the suffering of the Messiah, this, and this is a quote from Baltema, it says, regarding the suffering of the Messiah, there seems to be no language strong enough bring out the wholly unique character of the suffering and the most fundamental cause of the suffering. And I found that myself to be very true. Um, It's ironic, these last three verses um, seem to be the most precious to me, but I have struggled more in trying to prepare a lesson for these three uh, than any of the others. And um, so when I read that quote that there just doesn't seem to be enough, our our language is just inadequate in really communicating um, the depth of Christ's suffering and what it means to us. 
So let's start with um, point number one. Pleased. The Lord was pleased to crush him. It's a difficult statement to say the least. How can any father be pleased to crush his son whom he loves? Some have actually called it cosmic child abuse. If that's true, then every parent who's ever allowed their son to go to war is involved in child abuse. Because that's basically what the father has done. But they lack understanding of that. If we simply read this at face value, it is difficult. But Manton, in his book, makes this point. It's very observable in the New Testament that those words which imply their malice, the people who crucified Christ, do also imply God's appointment. So we're going to look at some verses in the New Testament, primarily Matthew. So if you could turn with me there. We're going to look at one word, um, delivered, the word delivered, um, sometimes translated betrayed in some of the translations, but it's the same word in the original language. Matthew 26, 15. Remember, Manton said it's very observable in the New Testament that those words which imply their malice, the way they're delivering Christ over, do also imply God's appointment. 26.15. Referring to Judas Iscariot. Uh, we'll begin in 14. And one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him or to deliver him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. So we see that Judas delivered Christ to the chief priests. Hold your place in Matthew, because we'll be coming back there and turn to Acts chapter 3. Verse 13, this is in Peter's sermon. Uh, verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So we see that the people uh, delivered Jesus over. In John chapter 19, uh, verse 11. Jesus answered, you would have no authority, and he's speaking to Pilate here, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. This could either be referring to um, Judas, the people, or the chief priests and scribes could really apply to any one of those, probably primarily to the chief priests and elders. Uh, math, back to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. Now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. And the same chapter, verse 26, says, Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over, or delivered him, to be crucified. 
and then Romans 8. Romans 8, uh, we'll begin with verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also freely give us all things? So we see that Judas delivered Christ. The people delivered him. The chief priests and the elders of the people delivered him over to be crucified. Pilate delivered him to be crucified. And God the Father delivered him to be crucified. Judas delivered him for envy or for gain. Judas delivered him for gain. The priests for envy. The people in blind zeal. Pilate to keep up his esteem with the Jews but God to make out an ends for the salvation of his people. <clears throat> it's ironic and sometimes a little hard to understand, but God delivered him over just like all the others did to be crucified. Harry Baltema answers the question in his book on Isaiah, why did the servant have to suffer? And the highest and best answer to that question is that it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord. This removes all speculation that he was simply a martyr dying for his ideals or a sinner dying for his sins. He died because it pleased the Father to crush him. So then we have to ask the question, why? Why did it please the Father to crush him? In human eyes, it's unthinkable, it's unimaginable. How could it possibly please the Father to crush his son whom he loves? I have three basic brief comments about this, um, but I fear that when I'm done, you still won't be able to comprehend it. Number one is God's justice. Sin had to be atoned for. He was crushing every sin that was laid on his son. Corinthians 5.21 says he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So he was pleased to crush him. It's important to point out that even though he became sin, he did not become a sinner. Two completely different things. He took our sin upon himself. So the first point is God's justice. The second point is God's grace. We can't, again, begin to fathom the extent of God's grace, which he wants to demonstrate to us. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. It speaks of grace there. Uh, 4 through 7. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And here's why he did that. In, in, at least in New American Standard, the next two words are so that. So he did all this for this reason. And this reason is that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. How much grace would it take 
for him to continually show us his grace for ages to come. I don't know how long an age is, but it's a long time, I'm sure. And it's more than one age. So that's it just, that's a lot of grace. That's all I can say. That's a lot of grace. Point number three is God's love. And I'll credit this quote to Pastor. Um, he made this statement once, and it stuck with me. Um, we're completely self-centered as human beings. God is other-centered. We can't really comprehend other-centered. Therefore, we can't begin to comprehend God being pleased to crush his son for us. That's a lot of love. So we need to ask the question then, what benefit comes from the father crushing his suffering servant? And these are listed right here in our passage in Isaiah. In verses 10 through 12. The first one, he will see his offspring. So who are his offspring? His offspring are the spiritual descendants that come after him, those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Those who are born again are his descendants. So he will see his offspring. Point number two, he will prolong his days. This is where we see the resurrection. He will prolong his days. He was just killed. He was just crushed. He was just buried in our previous verses. Now he's going to see his offspring and he's going to prolong his days. Speaks of resurrection and eternal life. Number three, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And it's God's will and pleasure that we would be saved. And we'll look at that a little more later on. Number four, the triune God is satisfied with the suffering servants, servants payment for sin. And we'll spend more time with that too. Number five, the suffering servant will justify many having borne their iniquities. And we'll spend more time with that as well. The suffering servant, in verse 12, will receive the spoils. The spoils are you and me, believers, fellow believers. And the servant, suffering servant, interceded and continues to intercede for the transgressors. Um, The verb tense on that statement uh, where it says he interceded for the transgressors is actually one that implies it's an ongoing role that he's that he does. So those seven benefits come from the father crushing his son for us. First Corinthians five twenty one says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And you'll probably hear me refer to that verse quite often. It just fits Isaiah fifty three so well. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's why God was pleased to crush him. He was crushing every sin that Christ took upon himself. Every sin that's ever been committed and every sin yet to be committed. For 4,000 years or more, God patiently tolerated sin in his people, looking forward to the day when he would crush his son and every sin that was laid upon him and his wrath would be satisfied. Praise be to God. Reminds me of another time when God took action and was pleased with the results. When he was finished creating all things, when he finished creating man, he looked and saw that it was very good. And he was pleased with his actions. He was pleased with his creation, and he's pleased 
with our recreation. Ephesians 2.10 says, I think that's 4.10, says we are his workmanship. No, it is 2. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So we are recreated in him. Thomas Manton <clears throat> divides verse 10 out this way. First is the cause of his suffering. The Lord was pleased to crush him. The nature of his sufferings, that he would render himself as a guilt offering. And the fruit of his suffering. And there are three. The propagation of his spiritual seed. He will see his offspring promulgation of his life, he will prolong his days. I'm sorry, the prolongation, prolongation of his life, he will prolong his days, and the promulgation of the will of God in his hands, where it says, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Because of these benefits, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Let's take a look at Colossians 1. 19 and 20. Speaking of the good pleasure of the Lord and God being pleased to crush his son. Colossians 1.19 For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself having made peace through the blood of his cross. Let's turn back a few pages to Ephesians 1 5. It says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention or the good pleasure of his will. So it pleased him to adopt us into his family. And as I said in Colossians, he accomplished it through the blood of Christ. So it was God's good pleasure that we should be saved through Christ's work at Calvary, and he sacrificed his son, and he crushed his son for that purpose. So let's look for a moment at the statement, putting him to grief. Uh, grief actually translates in many Bibles as sick or sickness. And the word sick is derived from a verb in the original language, which means to squeeze dry or to hurt. McCray states in his book on Isaiah that the word sickness in the Hebrew makes no distinction between a condition caused by bacteria and one produced by violence or accident. So it doesn't refer to sickness as we think of sickness here in our culture. It could be uh, assault, it could be uh, torture, it could be an accident when you fall and hurt yourself. So the last statement in this verse declares that by offering himself as a guilt offering, the servant will cause the good pleasure of the Lord to prosper. Point number two, crushed. And this is very closely related to our first point. But here in verse 10, we see again the death of the Messiah as he is crushed. It's plainly stated one more time in this chapter, in verse 12, where it says he poured out himself to death. Some of the previous times it's been alluded to, 
Isaiah wants to make it perfectly clear. He poured out himself to death. But then verse 10 turns a glorious corner because this, as we mentioned, is where we see his resurrection. It's a little bit masked or hidden, but for good reason. But it is there. After it speaks of him being crushed, it says he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And then in verse 12, the father says, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, or the spoils with the strong. So this is clearly speaking of a living person. Dead people can't do these things. So we see the resurrection here in Isaiah 53. Oftentimes we're somewhat critical of the Jewish people for not understanding these things in Scripture. But if they completely understood the death and resurrection of the Messiah, I think that perhaps could have had some negative consequences. I mean, if anyone claimed to be the Messiah, I mean, they could kill him, right? Even prematurely. If he's the Messiah, he's going to be resurrected. If he's a, not the Messiah, he's a false prophet deserving of death. So either way, it was okay, in theory. But God has good reasons for not revealing everything to us in scripture. That was just a little side note. Verse 10, Jesus offered himself as a guilt offering. In Leviticus 6, 1 through 7, it refers to the guilt offering and talks about the requirements for it there. But a guilt offering deals with various types of deception. One of the requirements is to restore what was robbed from another and then offer a sacrifice for it, a ram without blemish. When Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, he robbed us from God. We were God's possession, and we were robbed from God, or you might say we willingly went to God, but we were deceived um, by Satan. So we were robbed by Satan from God. Um, however, instead of the guilty party offering the sacrifice, God, the innocent, innocent party, offered the sacrifice. Jesus became our guilt offering. He was the sacrifice, and we were the possession being restored. We were created by God and for God, and were his prized possession. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we can be restored to God as his possession. When we're born again, we're swearing allegiance to God through Christ's sacrifice. He is our guilt offering. So Satan robbed us from God, but God came down and offered the sacrifice so we could be restored. Baltema, again, states that we owe the guilt-removing sacrifice of Christ only to the good pleasure of the Lord, to his great mercy. His good pleasure is the final cause of sacrifice and the means of bruising his son. Hence, is it, it does not say it pleased the Lord that he was bruised, for this would not please him at all. He hated and despised the work of the murderers. The father himself bruised him. The people were but instruments. All these things took place according to his counsel and his foreknowledge. I'll read you a verse in Acts chapter 2 concerning that. 2.23 says, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. 
So we see there that it's God's will and God's predetermined plan, even though he used evil men to accomplish that plan. For wicked men to perform this cruel and heinous, murderous act solely on their own accord would mean that men were overruling God, that they were running the show and calling the shots. It would mean they were more powerful than God, right? They were in control. So no, the scripture says it pleased the Lord to crush him. God is in control. And it was God's plan from the beginning. Baltema comments again. He says, a remarkable phenomenon is that from now on, in the rest of Isaiah, we no longer find any mention of the servant of the Lord. We do have references to servants of the Lord, plural, where it's referring most likely to Israel. Um, and in 61, 1 through 3, the servant is alluded to but not mentioned. And this is very significant. It tells us that with Christ's suffering and death, his state as a servant has come to an end. And the next time we see him, he will be as king of kings and lord of lords. Isaiah 53, 6 says, The Lord has caused the iniquities of us all to fall on him. And 53, 12, Yet he himself bore the sin of many. So because of our sin that was laid on him, Jesus had to die. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So once our sin was laid upon him, he had to die. It pleased the Father to crush him. But everything Jesus suffered, that's what we deserved. It was only by God's grace and mercy that he took it upon himself. Let's look at point number three, satisfied. This word, in my opinion, is the most important word in the whole chapter. And yet when I studied it, I was somewhat disappointed find out that not many others gave it the prominence that I feel it deserves. Satisfied. The Father was sad. And there's some discretion. Um, I mean, some believe that Jesus saw his own suffering and his own sacrifice and is satisfied with that. Some see the Father as seeing his uh, suffering and is satisfied probably doesn't make that much difference either way. The Godhead saw his suffering and was satisfied with that. I mean, you have to ask the question, what if they weren't? I mean, that changes everything, right? But God saw it and was satisfied. The Hebrew word saba or sabeah means, it's the Hebrew word for satisfied means to fill to satisfaction, to have enough, um, be to the full, have plenty of. Um, so we see Christ's death on Calvary's cross provided an abundance and paid in excess our debt of sin. Hallelujah. I hesitate in some ways to make this next statement because it can be misused, but... Paul made the statement too, so I guess I can. Um, we can't out sin Christ's payment. If we could, that would mean our sin is greater than his grace, right? Now, that's not an excuse to go out and sin. As Paul states in Romans 6, may it never be. But yet, I want us to understand the depth of Christ's payment and provision for us. 
and there are some that teach that it's okay to go out and sin and enjoy it because it's already paid for. But it's not like going out and buying a new car and enjoying your new car. Um, if we sin without remorse, we probably need to question our salvation. We're commanded to be holy as God is holy. And the magnitude of his payment is much more than we can ever comprehend or express. But we need to understand the depth of Christ's payment and provision for sin. There's another word that correlates with this word satisfied, primarily used in the New Testament. It's the Greek word helasmos or helasterion. It means to propitiate or propitiation. In its very basic sense, it means to take away wrath. First John, we'll just take a couple look, look at a couple verses here on how that's used. First John 2.2 2. Uh, We'll start with one. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, like we just talked about. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And I'll turn over a couple more pages to 410. says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> so that word propitiation, you could almost insert um, one who takes away wrath in there in place of propitiation. So we have to ask the question, what is it that Jesus' death satisfies? Well, it satisfied the Father's wrath towards sin and sinners. How amazing is that? (laughs) How incredible, how comforting is that? We have seen the Father's wrath towards sin in descriptions of his action against Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the ground opening up and swallowing thousands of Israelites for disobedience. Um, We've seen his wrath in fiery serpents, on the Israelites for their disobedience and rebellion. We've seen destruction of nations. We've seen his treatment towards Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and on and on. That's the Father's wrath against sin. Romans 1.18 lays it right out for us, says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So God's wrath is revealed against ungodliness. The wrath of God... um, Now let's take a look, one more verse here. Ephesians Ephesians 5, 3, and 6. I'll start with verse 2 here. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Not sure that's quite the verses I wanted, but uh, we'll move on. This is how he should treat all of us because 
we're all sinners with his wrath. Um, and it's what we deserve. But Romans 5, 9 tells us <clears throat> start with 8 but God demonstrates his own love toward us in this while we were yet sinners Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him so we're saved from the wrath of God through Christ Alfred Martin speaks of, the, of this one word satisfied He calls it the crown of his atonement. And I think that's a good description. In this one word, we have hope, forgiveness, and atonement. This one word summarizes the results of Messiah's suffering. This one word expresses God's pleasure and contentment in Christ's work at Calvary. The Father is satisfied. God's wrath has been appeased. We are no longer under judgment and condemnation if we believe and accept Christ's work at Calvary on our behalf. The Father is satisfied. Are you satisfied? Am I satisfied with Christ's atonement on the cross? Many are not. So the payment for sin, this atonement, this satisfying of the Father's wrath is what Jesus was referring to when he cried out on the cross, it is finished. His work is done, the payment is made, and the Father is satisfied. Hallelujah. Our last point is justified, or justification. Working my way back to Isaiah 53 says, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. If you've read much poetry, um, you realize that things are often stated different, differently in poetry than they are in normal conversation or in prose writing. Um, to complicate matters even more, if that poetry is originally written in a foreign language and translated into your language, That complicates it a lot more. If it's theology, where every word is scrutinized, that sometimes makes it a little difficult um, to know what the author's original attempt was. So, of course, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit and spend much time in prayer asking for guidance and understanding the meaning God intended. An example would be something like Psalm 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's poetry. Um, So what is it I shall not want? The Lord? Or the Lord is my shepherd? Or anything other than the Lord? Um, It makes things a little bit awkward sounding at times. When this says, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, does it mean through Christ's knowledge, we are justified? Well, that doesn't sound right. I think we're justified through his shed blood on Calvary's cross. Um, so what, what's the intent here? Um, Alfred Martin states it by the knowledge of himself, many will be justified. I think that's getting a little closer Um, John MacArthur and Edward Young both say by the knowledge of him. And I think that's, um, I think I know what they mean there. Uh, Many will be justified. It says, I think in other words, by knowing and understanding Jesus and his work on the cross for us, we can be justified. Maybe it could be said by knowing Christ, we will be justified by the only, because the only way to know him is to come to him through his sacrificial death on the cross by his blood. So I think the intent is through our knowledge of him, through 
through knowing him, we are justified. And justified simply means to render innocent or just, to declare righteous. Probably a definition we've all heard is justification means just as if I had never sinned. And that's a pretty good definition. So the phrase will justify many can be rendered in English will cause many to be accounted righteous. God considers all who trust in the Lord's servant as if they had never sinned. His righteousness is imputed to us, our iniquities are laid on him, and it's because he bears them that we are justified. Take a look at a couple verses regarding justification in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. 1 Corinthians 6. See, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, the covetous, drunkards, revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, and such were some of us. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. When you look at that list and then you slide in there that meaning definition of justification, all those wicked things just as if they had never sinned. Um, that's pretty amazing. Romans 5, 9. I think we read that once already. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So we see that justification is through his blood. And a couple pages to the right, to Romans 8, 31 to 34. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So we see again that we're justified through Christ and through his death at Calvary. This last statement says that he intercedes for the transgressors. And as I stated earlier, this verb is in an imperfect tense, which is normally translated as future, meaning he continues to intercede. So in summary, it pleased the Lord to crush him. 1 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's why God was pleased to crush him. He was crushing every sin that Christ took upon himself, every sin that's ever been committed, and every sin yet to be committed. committed. For 4,000 years or more, God patiently tolerated sin in his people, looking forward to the day he would crush his son and every sin that was laid upon him, and his wrath would be satisfied. Number two, crushed. We owe the guilt-removing sacrifice of Christ only to the good pleasure of the Lord, to his great mercy, 
his good pleasure is the final cause of sacrifice and the main means of bringing his son, bruising his son. Three is satisfied. Christ's death satisfied the Father's wrath towards sinners. This one word expresses God's pleasure and contentment in Christ's work at Calvary. The Father is satisfied. God's wrath has been appeased. We are no longer under judgment and condemnation if we believe and accept Christ's work at Calvary on our behalf. Justify through knowing him, many will be justified. The phrase will justify many can be rendered in English as will cause many to be accounted righteous. God considers all who trust in the Lord's servant as if they had never sinned. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, there's so much more here that um, is beyond our understanding and um, it reveals your depth and knowledge to us, Lord. We thank you for your word. We pray it will do your work in our lives. In Jesus' name.